So I'm joined by Professor John Spencer, who's an Emeritus Professor here at the uh, Law Faculty, a specialist in criminal law. Do you want to start by introducing yourself in more detail? Yes, Amy. For many years I taught criminal law and criminal procedure, and I'm still involved in them to some extent. So I still edit this journal, Archbold Review, which is for practitioners relating to criminal law. And I edit various books relating to it. I, for many years, used to lecture to judges in what used to be the Judicial Studies Board and is now called the Judicial College. I also know about and have taught and written about continental criminal procedure. Um, I was a professeur invité in France a number of times and the equivalent in Belgium and the equivalent in Italy. And I've written in English um, books about continental criminal procedure and I have actually written in French a book about English criminal procedure. And I've also been involved at various levels in EU criminal law over the years, in particular as a result of being part of the team involved in producing this study, the Corpus Juris study, which was published in 1997, putting forward the idea of a European public prosecutor to bring proceedings in the member states for frauds on the EU budget, the difficulty being that national prosecutors often give them rather a low priority compared with national crimes. And that leads on to the first thing I'd like to say about European criminal law, which is something that it isn't. It isn't a Brussels plot to abolish the common law and force us and all the other member states to have something horrendous called the Napoleonic system or the inquisitorial system, which is something you often read as one of the reasons why we must have Brexit in the referendum. You saw in the Daily Express on the 10th of May, exclusive Brussels plot to impose Euro law after referendum, a threat to our freedom, etc. Uh, plans to create a centralised EU prosecutor will fatally undermine our legal system and kill off principles of trial by jury and innocent until proven guilty. Total nonsense. This is all as a result of a completely distorted account of the Corpus Juris project, which was a proposal to introduce a European public prosecutor. And in the original proposal, we did suggest that the European public prosecutor should have to follow certain rules. And far from saying that people would be presumed guilty, in Article 31 of the project, we said, Burden of proof, any person accused of one of the offences set out above is presumed innocent until his guilt has been established legally by a final judgment. So this story about the Brussels plot is on a par with the story about the northeast floods on Boxing Day being caused by the EU and the EU having a plan to stop the Queen having corgi dogs and the EU having a plan to stop us having double-decker buses in London and all those similar Euro myths. So what is European criminal law then? It consists of five bits rather disparate at the moment. There's a body of law regulating institutions which have been set up like Europol and Eurojust and on the way a European public prosecutor if that should ever happen. The aim of these things is to try to coordinate efforts at dealing with crime across borders. Then, with a similar aim, there are a body of instruments to encourage police cooperation. For example, an EU instrument providing a legal basis for setting up joint investigation teams into crimes with cross-border um, elements to them. And then there's a body of instruments to do with mutual recognition, that's to say providing for the more or less automatic recognition and enforcement of judgments and orders from courts in other member states, head of the list being the European arrest warrant, which everybody's heard of. Then there are measures trying to harmonise criminal law by trying to ensure a common approach to certain forms of misbehaviour, particularly ones which 
cause problems across borders like terrorism, drug smuggling, money laundering, child pornography. These instruments require the member states all to have criminal laws punishing these things and to have maximum sentences which are of at least a certain degree of severity. And then lastly, there are some instruments trying to harmonize criminal procedure by requiring the member states to ensure their criminal procedure does various things like respect victims' rights in certain ways and provide certain minimum rights for defendants. And the aim of this is to try to reinforce mutual recognition by ensuring that the courts of the different member states have confidence in the qualities of justice in the other member states whose orders and judgments they're expected to enforce. The Luxembourg court system, as of December 2014, now has a measure of jurisdiction over all this, but it's quite limited. It can have infringements proceedings brought against member states that fail to carry out their obligations. Not much of a threat to the UK, which has a good record of implementing its uh, international obligations and its European obligations, which is one of the reasons why the UK is rather cautious about letting itself in for these obligations. And it can also entertain preliminary references from our courts. So if one of our courts has a question that arises as to the compatibility of some piece of national legislation with a European instrument, it can ask the Luxembourg court what the position is and should be and ask it for directions. And contrary to what some people think, Luxembourg isn't a further round of appeal in criminal cases, particularly for unmeritorious defendants. So why, why are we so exercised by all of this? I think we're exercised by it because a lot of people have got completely hold of the wrong end of the stick about what EU criminal law is about. As I've explained it, most of it is about trying to ensure that the justice systems of the member states, the different justice systems of the different member states, work to some degree step in step to deal with pri crimes and problems which operate across borders. And there's absolutely no question of there being a kind of Brussels plot to enforce the UK to give up the common law, as is internalised by UKIP and by quite a large section of the Conservative Party as well. And what might happen to all of this? So if we think that this body of rules is quite important, what might be the consequence of um, the referendum on, on that area of regulation? If the UK left, the result could be that we'd be relieved of the burdens of this legislation insofar as it imposes burdens and that we would be deprived of the benefits of this legislation insofar as it confers benefits. Would the loss of benefits matter? Well, we have to remember that the purpose of EU criminal law is to deal with the unwanted consequences of free movement, free movement of persons, goods, capital and services, which is basic element of EU policy and designed to encourage free trade. It's designed to deal with the fifth freedom, the unwanted free movement of criminals and crime. And not having the benefit of this legislation would matter or wouldn't matter depending on how much free movement we were left with after whatever exit deal was done. If the UK were to turn itself into a sort of Northern European North Korea with borders firmly shut, it wouldn't matter at all. If, as is expected, some measure of free movement continued, then there would be, in function of the amount of free movement, problems resulting from not having the benefits of this body of law. What exactly would happen is uncertain, as it is with almost everything else to do with Brexit, because if we leave in an orderly fashion, following the procedure laid down in the treaties, 
there would be negotiated an exit package, and this exit package might say business continues in respect of this or that or the other part of EU criminal law. But let's assume, as is more likely, there'd be some kind of clean break settlement. In that case, I don't think there would be many practical consequences from no longer being part of the body of rules harmonizing criminal law or harmonizing criminal procedure. But the pinch would come with not being part anymore of the body of law about the institutions like Europol or the police cooperation measures like joint investigation teams and other related things or mutual recognition instruments like the European arrest warrant. The legal sky wouldn't fall if that case because that happened because there would be ways around it but they wouldn't be easy ways. I think as regards the institutions like Europol we would be able to negotiate some kind of associate status but we'd be hangers-on, not members, so we wouldn't be making the policy. We'd be sitting on the sidelines and taking what they gave us. As regards police cooperation and mutual recognition, we might be able to negotiate separate new deals with each member state, but there are 27 other member states and a long list of measures, and you've only got to multiply one by the other to see how there's rather a lot of negotiation which our civil servants would have to do. Or we might be able to make, in some cases, a treaty with the EU directly. Or, as is often said, we might be able to fall back on some of the pre-existing international agreements by which we used to manage this sort of thing before the EU criminal law came along to try to do things better and quicker. Much talk is about the European Convention on Extradition, which is what we used to use as the basis for extradition between the other member states before there was the European Arrest Warrant, and which we still use and they still use when dealing with extradition with countries that aren't members of the, Euro of the European Union, though are members of Europe, obviously part of Europe. And it's true that we could resurrect the European Convention on Extradition as the basis of dealing with the other member states if the UK left the EU and we weren't part of the European Arrest Warrant anymore. But we would resurrect the problems that we used to have with it. One of them is that the European Convention on Extradition allows contracting states to contract on the basis that they won't surrender their own nationals that's never been the position of the UK. We've always been quite happy to hand over our own nationals by extradition, but it was the position taken by France, Germany, and some other quite big and populous countries. And in the days when that existed, and we had to use the convention, if somebody from one of those countries came here and committed a crime and went back home again, we couldn't get him, and the only way that he could be brought to justice was by arranging for him to be tried in that country, which meant shipping the evidence and the witnesses out there. And the consequence sometimes was that justice failed and we would have the same problems resurrected as well as the instrument uh, resurrected as well. So we'd manage somehow, I think, but though the sky wouldn't fall, we would certainly have difficulties which we don't have at the moment. Perfect. Thank you.